So then I said to him, Frank, I said, I said, you know that, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, hello um, to this um, uh, bit of sand uh, that you're looking to, to, to buy. Um, it's, um, it's sandy. It's got lots of sand in it. You should be able to uh, pick up some sand here. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Campaign Creator Series. My name is Guy and we're talking Sandbox. Sandbox. Not this stuff behind me, but Sandbox Adventures. Rather than something that's planned, we're looking for something that's unplanned. Sandboxing. Allowing the players to go wherever they so choose. So far, we have done the exact opposite. We have planned and plotted everything on our journey. So why now do we talk Sandbox? Well, because by now in your campaign, hopefully you've started playing it already, you might have got to the point where you're like, the main story is fantastic, the main story is working beautifully, but I need my players to sometimes have a bit of a break, I need my players to feel as if they have a bit of agency, or I need five years to happen in, in, in my game so that my players get a sense of time moving forward. What am I going to do during those five years? So you might want to add in sandboxing. So sandboxing for me can be broken into three things. Mapping markets and madness. So whenever people say to me, oh, how do you run a, a, a sandbox game? How do you prepare for a sandbox game? Which by definition is the players going wherever they want their characters to go and you as the GM playing tag and trying to keep up with wherever it is that they're going. You're not prescribing a major event or adventure series they're kind of finding it as they go and you're making it up as you go along so i use the three m's mapping markets and madness now these might not work for everybody but these are what work for me mapping mapping talks about making maps with options so i'm going to head on over here to uh, world anvil just so you can have a look. We're in World Anvil. I'm going to go to my Explorer. This is a new feature that they added. Well, not anymore. It's not new anymore. But this is what I like when it comes to sandboxing. Is I can go to my Atlas. I can go to Ethereos. And when we talk about mapping and, and looking for areas that give us latitude. Last week, we looked at why maps are useful. Now we're going to look at how we can use them for sandboxing. So we choose this area here, the Cyrus Forests. And let's say, for example, Thermos is fairly isolated. There are no main roads leading to it. We can see that from the map. So again, maps with options. So we want to create maps with options. We don't want to fill in too much stuff. That's important. We don't want it to feel as if everything is prescribed because then that is technically moving away from the sandbox idea that is moving towards a controlled space which is apparently what we don't want. So making maps with options allows us to choose and to, 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 to almost be inspired, if you like, uh, in terms of, of where we're going to go. And if our players start to head into the Cyrus Forest or if they start to, to, to um, head up here in this direction towards Neros and those sort of things, we can do all kinds of things. What I particularly like is a function that we're going to come back to a little bit later on. So maps with options. Creating generic maps. We've been doing that this entire time. That's all we've been doing is creating generic maps. Mapping out a villa, mapping out a barracks, mapping out a castle, mapping out whatever. Now, this is a map that I did. This is in Dungeon Fog. So this is a map of a church very generic church. I, I literally went with the old-fashioned nave and transepts because that is what was important for, for, for this particular encounter. It's completely, completely generic. I could drop this map in anywhere into almost any campaign. I could drop this into a fantasy campaign. I could drop this into a, a Victorian campaign. I could drop this into a modern day campaign. None of it would feel out of place. I could even, in theory, put it into a science fiction campaign if the characters have landed on a planet with old fashioned stone architecture. So creating generic maps is going to be a way in which you can control how the sandbox starts to unfold without panicking that you don't have material. 
The other thing to think about is short adventures. So how do you map out short adventures? What do you do when it comes to, to creating short adventures? Well, that's when I go back to my map and that's when I find a function within World Anvil useful. But whatever program you're going to be using, it could be post-it notes, although that could be a bit tricky. But again, as I say, it's about creating things that are going to help you. So when we come here, for example, let's say that your characters have ended up in Lemuri. No, I'm sick of Lemuri. Let's go somewhere else. Uh, here, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Um, Eula. They're arrived in Eula. That's right. The end user license agreement. No, they've arrived in Eula. And that's where your adventure series has uh, your, your session has ended for the day. They then leave. You can then look at Eula and say, right, this is part of Uthia. That is the district that they're in. Broadly speaking, we've got a forest over here. Right. I'm going to right click on this forest and I am going to say, um, I'm going to say uh, bandits and I'm going to put in a description for myself. Um, let's say robbing uh the poor to give to the rich um what do the players know about uh, what why what do the players know about this at the moment they know a name so let's put in a name of uh francos uh Dulii, uh ringleader local bandit OK, so I'm going to just drop in that there. I'm going to select a marker. And because it is, uh, let's say it's a camp, it's a dangerous one. It's a combat one. I'm going to make it orange. And that's all I'm going to do is I'm going to create that marker. I'm going to create that marker there. And then I'm going to say, OK, well, we've also got this mountain range here. So this one I'm going to put in here, strange cave. And the description is cave of wonders and secrets uh, supposedly lost but adventurer found before death and map has been left to daughter who wants someone to find Okay, and so we don't need to know anything about that. I'm going to go back to camp. Because this one is potentially uh, a problem-solving one, it's not, it's not dangerous, I'm going to make it violet for myself. So this is a code for myself. So I can then go around this entire area dropping pins. Now, again, this is, as far as I'm concerned, as close to sandbox as you're going to get. And... When we then are running our game, our players arrive at the table and we say, OK, so what do you guys want to do? And they say, oh, well, we want to go to the tavern and listen for rumors. Fantastic. You can now click on these things and say, as you walk into the tavern, there's a farmer. He looks beaten up and he's going, oh, it's these bandits. Only they're odd. They're bandits. They're eyewomen. They robbed me on the road between here and uh, uh, Akumano. But they all wear a uniform. It's very strange. Very strange. And the local lord, he says we're lying and we're just trying to defraud them. I hate it. You know, I'd be willing. I'd be willing. I've spoken to some of the farmers. We're looking to get a band together. We'd be willing to pay lads to join us too. There's an adventure hook. Done. Next one. You're walking down the street when a woman walks past you and says, Oh, I'm terribly sorry. You look as if you're from out of town. I don't suppose you know anything about spelunking. I have a map which my father found, and it apparently leads to a cave filled with wonders. Uh, not far from here. In other words, you're starting to create these pins. Now, this is the important thing for me, is these are short adventures. These don't necessarily need to be long ones. They could be, if you so chose. The woman leading to the cave, the lord of the um, bandits who is orchestrating the bandits, is looking for the map because he knows it's somewhere in the Eula city or village. He's looking for that sort of thing. And so that's why the bandits are there. You could link them together. What I like, though, about having these pins available in an online space, regardless of the software being used, is that if the players go, nah, I don't want to help farmers, nah, I don't want to go spelunking another cave adventure, nah, we want to go uh, to um, Pythios and uh, hang out with hookers, I don't know, uh, we want to go to Pythios and we want to go and do stuff in Pythios. 
you have potentially now got them going on a journey. That still doesn't matter though, because as you're going to see, we've got other tricks up our sleeves and those pins that we created before are going to come back to help us. So we're going to look now at markets. Markets are derived from your maps. And again, this is entirely up to you how you want to use your software. For me, I'm visual. I like visual cues. I like to use visual bits and pieces. So where there is gold, there is war. And I don't mean massive armies invading one another. I don't mean anything along those lines. There could be smuggling cartels. There could be lords who are trying to fleece the gold from their peasants. And they've basically warred them, they taxed them to the point where the peasants are near rebellion. That's quite a big potential adventure arc that you've got there. The peasants are almost in a revolting situation. They need leadership. They need help. They need to steal something to try and convince the lords to change it. So where there is gold, there is conflict. There is war. Scarcity creates opportunity. Again, another really useful thing. Let's go back to this map. Map was made in Wonderdraft, um, just in case you're wondering. So let's say they're here at the Court of Venerosiae. So the Court of Venerosiae is isolated. It's in the Minari Bay, uh, part of the Jaffa Straits, isolates it from the mainland. The closest city is Acumenio which as our pin, which we've dropped in months, years ago, is a sleepy slave trading city. Okay, great. So the markets already, we're starting to see something. Now there isn't a pin, a, a pin here for the court of Venerosi. So as the players arrive, they've been on some quest or other, they've just arrived in Venerosi. What do we do? We say, okay, well, we're gonna go and look for scarcity creates opportunity. What a great scarcity. Venerosity is on an island, it's isolated. It's got some forests, which potentially have some animals in there, but there's not a lot of farming land. There's not a lot of uh, income, there are no mountains to mine for resources well perhaps there is here in this uh, mountain range up here but I'm not convinced so what are we going to do we can quite easily say that Venerosi is going to invade the Isidore mountain range that is an interesting one why because scarcity creates opportunity and where there is gold there is war so it starts to lead to these huge hooks that you can throw out Something that's also important to bear in mind, and this is what I keep in the back of my head. When my players want to go off and do something, they say, right, we want to go to the court of Venerosi. Okay, great. You arrive at the court of Venerosity. The scarcity leads to opportunity. The opportunity is that Venerosi is looking to hire people to go to the Isidore Mountains. Let's bring back that map. So the court of Venerosi is looking for people to go to the Isidore Mountains to scout out the prospects of the mountain range. Or perhaps it's not the Isidore mountain range. Perhaps it's this mountain range that's closer that doesn't have a name on it because we didn't need to name it. We can now name it on the fly. You go, right, uh, this is known as the uh, Breakwater Mountains. Mountains. And um, they are hives of strange insect-like creatures defend them uh defend them rich in iron and sapphires okay and we're going to select a marker here uh let's go with say it's not a castle it's not a church could go with circle again i like to use things that are, are important so let's create the marker Okay, so it is done. It is there. We can now click on it and we can now use it. So the, 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 the immediate quest is to go out there. And how did that quest come about? By looking at our markets. What do they want? What are they willing to do with it? So the very first question, where's the money? Then we start to look at stronger and weaker. So Corto Venerosi, let's say it's strong. They're a thriving, independent island nation. They're part of the hegemony of Utherios, but they're not a very, a very um, active part because they're isolated. They have lots of power. They have lots of money because they control the Minari Bay. Generally speaking, those kinds of plots are going to involve deception. When there's lots of money, there is a big risk of war. 
War makes people cautious, or at least they should be. So usually deception starts to come in. It's the subtleties, the manipulations of the merchant to get the working class to work for less and pay them less and tax them more. It's the courtiers maneuvering around a court. It's a vizier who's pulling the strings behind the king's throne. Lots of deception comes in with stronger nations. With weaker nations, generally, it's about survival. So your adventures would be more on the survival. Let's say the court of Venerosi once was a strong and powerful one, but has basically been reduced to near cannibalism because they've run out of food and they don't have a lot of people left and everyone's sick and miserable. Now it's survival. Now that trip to the mountains, yes, it was originally to look for resources. Now it's to look for a cure for this plague because those insect creatures invaded the city and caused a plague to render everybody useless. So now it's a survival mission rather than a deception mission. So that helps focus you a little bit and it gives you guidance. Again, this is all about just allowing your mind to come up with things on the fly. And if you have these principles in the back of your head, it makes life a lot easier. I then like to introduce madness and I've already done that in terms of the map as you've seen. Madness is monsters. What monsters can we introduce? If we look at this great sandbox behind us, this great big desert, what kind of monsters would live in that space? If we look at our map, let's go to our map. If we look at our map, what kind of monsters would live in the Jaffos Straits, in the Minari Bay, in that mountain range? As we've already indicated, there's insect-like creatures. How did I choose insect-like as opposed to orcish or as opposed to Vulcans or whatever your setting is, is appropriate? It was quite literally, well, I haven't done insects in a while and I can't think of anything that's particularly scary. So that gives me an opportunity to go in there and make more, make my own monsters. Myths. What myths can we add in? Just the names of those areas, the mountain range that we called uh, Breakwater Mountains, I think it was called. Breakwater mountains. Why are they known as the breakwater? Well, because the coast has a particularly strong typhoon that washes against that area. The mountains protect the area behind it. So this forest area gets protected. And as a result, there's a particular type of flora or fauna that grows here, a particular type of orchid that will cure any malady deep within this forest, which is known as the Anastos forest, the Anastas forest. So deep within the Anastas forest, there are flora specifically behind the breakwater mountains that grow. That's a, a potential. So we've got to keep these things in mind. We've got to bear these things in mind. Freeform association, as you know, I have always described freeform association as being your most powerful tool when it comes to designing adventures anyway, is what just rolls off your head and you plop it down, you plop down these pins, no one will notice. As usual, if you've stayed until the very end, we've got some bonus material here. This is something that I think is very important for people to bear in mind when it comes to sandbox style games or when it comes to having a sandbox element within your game. This is something to bear in mind is that we can have our overarching sentence. We can have our big plot plan. But there's no rush to get that over and done with. We can have lots of stuff happening in between. We should have lots of stuff happening in between. And that's the sandbox stuff. So a lot of the sandbox stuff is going to be useful for you regardless of what type of campaign you're running. More hooks, less plans. Don't spend time planning it out. Don't worry about mapping out the mines or the hive collective that are within that mountain range in breakwater mountains. Don't worry about that. Don't panic. You've thrown out the hook that potentially they could go there. They could also quite easily, if they decide, no, that's crazy, we're going to Acumeno. There is nothing stopping you from when you when they arrive in Acumeno for you to drop some of these things. Oh, there's bandits on the road between Acumeno and Eula. Oh, there's a strange cave. You can drop those pins at any time. When you're sitting, you're bored, you kind of go, oh, let's just drop a thing, let's drop a thing, let's drop a thing. It's easy, it's easy. And then you start to draw on that. So you're creating this very sandboxy space. You're not planning on where the characters are going. They have complete free reign, but you're using the resources that you have at your disposal to maximize your opportunities for plot hooks. The PC chooses. That's the important thing. The PCs choose, the GM follows. So, so often I have GMs, I've seen GMs where they go, oh, this is the plot, you should follow it. And the players go, 
I don't feel like following it this this week. I've watched a TV series on my favorite streaming service or on old fashioned terrestrial television, which kind of was like that. I I I, I want to do something different. I want to go somewhere else. I want to go and do this. I want to do that. The GM follows the PCs choose. What are the PCs choosing from? It's still your world. So those pens, notes, whatever it is you're going to be using, they're going to be choosing from that. You are following along. So more hooks. Yes, there's this adventure going on. Yes, there's that adventure going on. And the PCs might get to the point where they're like, oh my goodness, there's so many things going on. I don't know which one to follow. That's fine. None of these will trigger until the PCs choose them. So that mysterious cave of wonder, the daughter is simply not going to find somebody who can go to the mines until the PCs say, all right, well, let's go to the mines. I think that's an important thing. Of course, if the PCs commit to going on an adventure and then they get sidetracked and they go somewhere else, you are well within your rights to have them arrive at that mine or at that uh, lost cave of mystery and discover that it's empty get back to the daughter and she goes oh no well you took so long i hired another group um they have the pay that i would have paid you uh, so thanks but no thanks so there's no reason why you can't simply say well you've chose that path and then you ignored it it's too late now or they arrive at the cave and now the cave goes from being a puzzle solving thing to well there are other people here and they want the reward so now it's a violence kind of conflict and always remember the four types of adventures, thwarting, delivering, collecting, and discovering. Discovering, collecting, and delivering, and thwarting. If you create those four pins around most of the major locations where the PCs are, again, when you have an afternoon, you just go pin, 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 or note, 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 however you want to do it. It's, it's, I find it easier when you're using some software that just does it for you. If you just go through those, okay, I need a thwarting mission, a delivery mission, a collection mission, and a discovery mission. And I'm going to mix them up. Again, that's the craft. The craft is putting down those four. The art, the art is making sure that the players at no point ever be able to go, oh, well, this was a thwarting mission. Yeah. Oh, it's a collection mission. Nah, I don't like those. Just going to do discovery ones. We don't want that. That's what MMOs do, and that's where MMOs fail because people go, oh, it's another collect 10 of these. It's another 12 of those. Don't do that. Use these as guides to create interesting plot hooks that your players can choose and then you can follow along. Less planning, more hooks. Anyway, until next time, thank you to Wonderdraft and to World Anvil for giving us these tools that we can utilize, oftentimes without a charge, sometimes with a charge. But hey, everyone has to pay the uh, money in one way, shape or form. And remember, markets help drive plot stories. So until next time, I wish you and yours the very happiest of campaign creation.